Uh, today I'll be focusing on uh, IoT security for smart cities and case studies based uh, mainly on the Biotope uh, project that we are running, uh, running uh, still for quite a while. <coughs> so uh, uh, the presentation uh, will focus okay, first on the Biotope project and the use cases uh, developed uh, there then go into uh, general uh, uh, comments on IoT security uh, and uh, presenting uh, in what way we are dealing with IoT security uh, also uh, based on the standards uh, that we are developing uh, with the open group uh, and finally conclusions. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the Biotope project, uh, Biotope stands for building uh, an IoT open innovation ecosystem for connected smart objects uh, so there will be a few slides uh, just to explain the background of this uh, Biotope project uh, so that you understand the use cases uh, better. So uh, this Biotope project is a uh, part of uh, uh, the biggest Internet of Things uh, initiative, I would say, of uh, Europe, uh, uh, IoT EPI uh, in the uh, European Union's Horizon 2020 program. It has a budget of nine and a half uh, millions uh, altogether. And uh, we started in January 2016 and will end uh, in May 2019. So uh, <coughs> Biotope, uh, the Biotope product, uh, I don't know how many of you know about uh, EU products and how they uh, usually operate, but uh, I have been uh, involved in quite uh, many uh, such uh, projects and uh, what I was always uh, annoyed about uh, is that uh, no matter how good the results and the systems uh, uh, were that you developed uh, at the end of the project, uh, the company just disappeared and uh, plugged out all the systems and uh, and uh, it didn't leave uh, much uh, sustainable uh, afterwards. Uh, so in Biotope, uh, what we, uh, or, well, it was uh, actually my decision that uh, this time we will not uh, see this happening. Uh, so uh, <laughs> what we started off uh, doing uh, was to collect the uh, real requirements of uh, citizens, uh, cities and so on, uh, uh, so that we would build the uh, use cases and systems that really address uh, real uh, problems uh, and challenges. Uh, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, I'm, uh, people who know me uh, know that I'm a pretty geeky guy, so uh, <coughs> I like the second part of building these uh, secure, open and standardized uh, systems or systems platforms uh, for IoT, but then especially uh, deploy these systems, systems in real cities uh, for real users, and then uh, ensure that these uh, systems will also operate uh, afterwards once the biotope ends. Uh, <clears throat> the consortium uh, uh, looks uh, like this. Uh, so yesterday you heard a presentation by uh, Florian Meyer from uh, BMW, uh, which I found uh, very interesting, obviously, <laughs> lucky enough. Uh, and in the consortium, uh, um, as uh, Florian was saying, we have uh, three uh, European cities, Helsinki, Brussels and Lyon. But we do also have uh, St. Petersburg uh, as uh, one of the pilot cities, as well as uh, Melbourne in, in Australia. So <clears throat> this slide was also shown by Florian yesterday. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, these are not actually the final use cases that we, uh, or the list of all the use cases that we developed in Biotope. Uh, uh, we, after this initial uh, sort of requirements around with the cities, uh, uh, we uh, understood that, uh, well, the initial ideas that we had uh, were not uh, always uh, the best ones. Uh, so we replaced uh, some of these uh, use cases uh, with other ones. But uh, the big point here uh, to notice is that uh, just about all these uh, use cases uh, do involve and uh, require information coming from many different information systems. Uh, so you need to combine loads of uh, data coming from different systems uh, representing different uh, domains using different uh, vocabularies. Uh, um, <clears throat> and then there was a blackout. Oh yeah, and uh, it's not just about data, it's also that uh, we speak a lot about open data, but actually we are focusing more in Biotope and in our standards uh, on enabling a sort of open APIs uh, so that you don't necessarily have to move the open all the data. You can just uh, open the services uh, that, uh, that then uh, uh, provide you with uh, what you need uh, without uh, having to uh, reveal confidential information. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, uh, I have been using this slide uh, since the beginning of the project more or less, but I think it's uh, still uh, quite uh, 
uh, useful to show uh, because uh, it does uh, illustrate some of the challenges that we have uh, wi with the systems that we want to implement. So uh, uh, what Florian was speaking about yesterday uh, from BMW uh, was uh, very much about this, uh, that uh, you have some car arriving into a, this happens to be a BMW i8. Uh, we are using i3s, uh, but uh, okay, it could be any any car arriving to any city uh, in uh, in the world. Uh, this happens to be Helsinki here. But the point is that no matter what car arrives to what city uh, uh, in the future, you should be able to do this kind of things. Uh, so uh, uh, the car would agree to uh, provide uh, some information to uh, systems uh, in the city. Uh, uh, that it trusts uh, for some reason. So if I just uh, drove into a pothole or if I just noticed that it's a uh, slippery, which uh, modern cars uh, will notice uh, because they have these uh, ESP systems. Uh, uh, ESP, did I say? No, okay, traction control systems. <laughs> so if this happens and then they could and should uh, trans transmit this kind of information to the city infrastructure uh, so that uh, uh, the city infrastructure could then provide back uh, uh, information such as uh, this, so that uh, if uh, nine cars already uh, went into this uh, pothole, uh, then uh, there's no point in uh, you being the tenth car going driving into the same pothole. Uh, so then you should uh, normally, or you should uh, receive a notification in advance saying that uh, well, a hundred meters ahead you will have a pothole. So e then either you could react to this, or your car, autonomous car, could react to it uh, somehow uh, and avoid it. Uh, and uh, <coughs> What we have implemented it was it's uh, this uh, finding parking places in uh, different uh, cities. Uh, now, of course, when we are speaking about this kind of scenarios and use cases, uh, there's a lot about uh, security uh, involved. Uh, so uh, uh, you would need to know or be sure that uh, okay, uh, the car that arrives is it a real car? Uh, so if it's uh, sending an inf information saying that uh, you have a pothole in this place. Uh, do you really have a pothole there or not? Uh, uh, because otherwise uh, you could, uh, well, some, somebody who wants to attack the city infrastructure could uh, send in, I don't know, 100 virtual cars uh, that would claim that there is a pothole in this place uh, of 10 meters of depth and actually stop uh, the whole uh, city circulation in the city. Uh. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is what we would like to achieve. Uh, then uh, uh, the way in which uh, the world looks uh, for the moment, uh, we have this uh, challenge of, of closed systems or uh, vertical silos uh, in cities. Uh, so uh, in pra what you tend to have in practice is that uh, you have a, a set of different parking uh, operators who have their own backend systems. And uh, then if you want to use them, uh, you need to install their app on your phone. Uh, same thing at least in Finland for electrical vehicle charging operators. If you want to charge uh, at uh, the pole of uh, a certain uh, charging pole operator, then well, you need to download their app uh, uh, or con at least connect to their uh, website and then uh, deal with it uh, over there. So <clears throat> in order to achieve our vision, well, uh, of course, uh, we would need all these systems to be somehow interoperable, and that means uh, that they should all use uh, a common set of open standards. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, this uh, picture here, it's, uh, uh, well, uh, the reason why I'm using this time glass uh, here in this picture is that uh, I some, sometimes have the impression that uh, standardization organizations uh, want to create new vertical silos. Uh, uh, with their stack of standards. Uh, that is not what we want to do here with the open group. What we want to do, uh, uh, just as you said for o uh, OPAS actually, it's that we <coughs> want to identif identify the uh, gaps where you don't have uh, existing standards, but if we, you do have existing standards, so there's no point in, in reinventing them. So we try to reuse uh, standards from no matter what uh, standardization organizations. So. Uh, in all our systems that we have uh, developed, uh, we have uh, used actually all of these different protocols and standards on the low level because uh, the best uh, protocol to use uh, there actually depends on the available hardware and on uh, what you actually want to do uh, uh, with, with the data. So how rapidly do you need to get access to it and so on. Oh, I have to watch out not to fall down there <laughs> speaking about security. <clears throat> okay. And then here on the upper level, 
you actually have loads and loads of uh, different vocabularies for different uh, domains uh, specified by well-known organizations such as uh, the UN, uh, GS1, and so on and so on. Uh, so all these vocabularies, uh, they actually provide data models uh, for different kinds of data, standardized data models for uh, different kinds of data and uh, <coughs> how you access them. But what we would like to, or we would like to have sort of a quite a limited uh, set of standards, it's really on this uh, here at the waist. Uh, so the standards that we are using, of course, in all the systems that you will be seeing, we are using HTTP, HTTPS, uh, web sockets, uh, secure web sockets, XML, JSON, and so on. But the smaller uh, block building blocks that we are adding here from the open group, it's uh, these standards here. So we have OMI, the open messaging interface, uh, which provides you with a lightweight uh, way of subscribing to different kinds of events, uh, such as, uh, well, do I have a, a pothole uh, in front of me or similar things. ODF. Uh, that provides you with a standardized uh, uh, structure for representing uh, uh, information about, uh, about different uh, things, uh, services, and so on. And then we have ODF, uh, which is the Open Data Element uh, Framework, uh, which is uh, a way uh, of expressing semantics uh, using existing uh, standards of all kinds. Uh, <coughs> OK. So uh, then to the actual uh, use cases. So the use cases uh, are all using some subset of these standards. Well, they are all using uh, OMI and ODF, uh, and then a subset of the other standards, depending on what you want to do. Uh. Now, I won't spend too much time on this slide. It actually comes uh, from uh, Florian uh, from uh, BMW. So this was about the smart mobility use case. Uh, uh, where we want to have uh, uh, smart houses uh, discussing with uh, the smart uh, uh, cars and uh, smart cars uh, discussing with, uh, with the parking uh, place operators as well as uh, charging uh, uh, pole operators and all this needs to be done in a secure way. Uh. So <clears throat> what uh, we have done here is uh, that uh, we have this set of existing uh, services in Helsinki or in other towns uh, but, or cities, uh, but in this uh, case Helsinki, where we have uh, done this mapping of their existing APIs and systems uh, using uh, uh, this, uh, in this case, a vocabulary called a Mobivoc uh, that is based on schema.org. So this is a standardized, well actually semi-standardized uh, way of, uh, of describing uh, parking places, electrical vehicle, charging poles, and so on. And then we publish uh, all these uh, using ODF, the open data format, uh, which gives us a hierarchical structure that uh, looks like this. You'll see more of it uh, later on. And that means that all these different information sources can be published, uh, represented, and accessed in the same way, no matter what is, uh, what, what is uh, the kind of services that they are actually uh, providing you. So I'll go back uh, maybe to this slide uh, because uh, then at least we have some information there. Now I was uh, expecting Florian to uh, show this uh, video yesterday but uh, he wasn't sure if it's uh, already officially well usable or not. Uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, you might be wondering, okay, uh, how is this related to IoT security? Well, uh, actually if you think about uh, what we have done here. so. Everything uh, that you saw here, actually, uh, all interoperability between the different systems is done using OMI and ODF plus these uh, semantic uh, standards that we were mentioning here. Uh, so <coughs> that's one part of it. Uh, you have to have all these systems actually understanding each other in a well-tested, documented, verified way. So what uh, we were doing uh, this week in Helsinki was actually to test that all the different systems, I think there's uh, five or six of them at least made by different companies actually interoperate uh, successfully. So uh, <coughs> that means that uh, uh, from an in Internet of Things uh, security point of view, uh, the building that speaks uh, with the car, with the robot's car, they have to know uh, and be sure th who they are speaking with. And also, uh, since uh, the house actually shares the information about when, when and if a robot is uh, leaving his home, 
you don't want anybody else uh, or some external people to actually be able to, to access uh, that kind of information. Uh, it's not good neither if uh, somebody uh, would get access to your BMW and, uh, and start telling it to heat or cool down or whatever it would be. If it's a plus 50 when you get into the car, that would be pretty embarrassing. <laughs> And uh, same thing for, sp for parking place operators, uh, you do want to be sure that all the information that you are accessing and uh, showing and using is uh, indeed provided by, by, some, by the right, uh, <coughs> right um, company, organization. Okay, <coughs> so uh, uh, this time I'm really focusing on these requirements uh, based on these uh, use cases. Okay, uh, European Union. <coughs> Uh, so then one other use case, uh, Florian, he was actually showing some of these uh, yesterday also, but uh, not uh, quite the same ones. Uh, the main use case that we are doing in Brussels, it's improving the safety around schools. So <coughs> in order to, to do this, uh, uh, we have uh, an app that has been developed uh, uh, for, uh, for the school children. So uh, they are using the, this on their phones uh, and uh, uh, they have actually um, allowed us uh, to follow where they are. So their location information, which is something pretty sensitive. We are actually getting the same information also from the operators uh, in Brussels. And, uh, we are, uh, and they have this possibility of uh, clicking and saying if uh, they feel safe or unsafe uh, when they come to uh, to a crossroad, for instance, or traffic light. Uh, so uh, if you have uh, loads of traffic uh, uh, or something else, uh, then uh, they can indicate uh, through this uh, that uh, this is, uh, if it's a good place or, or a bad place uh, to, to use at this uh, time of the day. So then once we get this kind of events, uh, we uh, combine that with information that we access from Waze. Uh, okay, and this was actually the location uh, information coming from the operator. So from ways uh, that uh, from which we get uh, uh, information about the traffic flows uh, uh, at that place and some other information too so that we can analyze then uh, what are the reasons uh, why uh, some uh, certain places in, in the city are felt uh, or perceived as being safe or not. Uh, but again <clears throat> uh, here we have the same case uh, especially for this uh, location information of the children. We do not want uh, the other children to be able to follow uh, where, uh, well, one child to follow where the other one is uh, going and uh, uh, this kind of things. Uh, so we do have this uh, information uh, collected into a central place uh, somewhere, but then uh, what we really need to be careful about is that we make sure that only the right uh, systems get access to that and that different systems only get uh, read or write or the appropriate level of access uh, to that uh, data. Okay, I think that's all that I have to say about this one. Then uh, <coughs> another use case uh, that uh, is implemented in Brussels uh, actually, so uh, I don't uh, think you would, will be able to use it uh, quite yet if you go to Brussels, uh, it's uh, still in pilot, uh, pilot use, so they have these uh, water buses uh, that uh, uh, you can take in Brussels. Uh, to go to different places and uh, what uh, they are publishing uh, there, it's uh, the location of uh, these water buses in, in real time using OMI and ODF. Uh, uh, they do also update the, the schedules, uh, not only to the OMI node, but they do also update uh, this uh, schedule information to uh, the Google Maps, in the Google Maps uh, format uh, so that uh, this information gets uh, published uh, or accessible there. So the point here is uh, that uh, we are not limiting ourselves neither to only OMI and ODF. Uh, if we have, as I was saying, since there are some, uh, okay, GTFS, uh, I think that's the Google format for publishing uh, time or schedules, uh, uh, since, well, it's a useful system, so uh, why not use it even though it's uh, not, it's provided by Google. But the point here uh, is that uh, Okay, uh, we don't uh, again want uh, anybody to start uh, pushing uh, any fake data about the position of uh, or the water bus or something similar. Now in classical systems uh, this kind of information uh, would come uh, so to say from uh, the downward part but here in Biotope uh, since we have many different organizations uh, developing these systems or providing information also over the internet uh, that actually gives us uh, some pretty uh, 
well, new and uh, tougher requirements on on security. <clears throat> okay, uh, then one more example in Lyon, uh, we have this uh, uh, heat wave mitigation system, uh, uh, which uh, is uh <clears throat> well heat wave mitigation. So what they are doing is uh, that. Uh, if it's really hot in uh, Lyon, uh, they know that uh, you can cool down certain places quite efficiently if you provide more water to the trees uh, there. So they have equipped uh, some uh, parks, uh, some trees in their parks uh, with, uh, with sensors uh, that indicate how much uh, water you actually have in the tree, so uh, you can measure that. And then based on the outside temperature, uh, on how much uh, water you have in the trees already and other things and uh, they decide if they give more water to the trees uh, or not uh, in order to cool down the climate uh, there. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> okay, all this uh, data it's uh, again annotated and published using OMI and ODF and some other uh, and some uh, semantic uh, uh, standards. So I guess I can go on from this slide to the next one. So this is what it looks like, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, for this use case, uh, when you are publishing this kind of information uh, in ODF format. So actually for all these use cases, uh, you can still access uh, somewhere what we call the OMI nodes and uh, see what the data looks like. Uh, so uh, this is not very human readable, but it's, uh, the main purpose here is that it should be machine readable. So uh, what you see here, it's uh, uh, this reference implementation that we have developed for all and ODF. Uh, and uh, you can see here that, uh, okay, you have, for instance, an actuator for irrig irrigation here, and you have a procedure called start or stop, uh, by which uh, you can uh, start it or stop it. Uh, you also have uh, uh, these coordinates uh, where it is uh, located. And this whole structure is uh, presumably and hopefully based on uh, some uh, existing standard or recommendation for this kind of system. So <coughs> for this Leon case I'm not completely sure, but uh, what is interesting to notice here also is that uh, they have combined several different uh, semantic standards. So for instance for this uh, moisture measurement that you have here, uh, they have specified the type of that element as a SOSA has a simple result. But to be honest, I don't know what uh, this SOSA is here. I don't think it's the same as uh, the open group one. Uh, uh, not sure. But uh, the point here is that, uh, okay, you do, in principle, uh, anybody could access uh, this uh, method of uh, starting or stopping uh, the, the irrigation, which uh, you obviously do not want everyone to be able to do. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> there's a lot of enterprise architects uh, here, so uh, you of course know that it's uh, very much a question of uh, how, uh, how do you actually configure the systems, uh, where do you install them, where do you put firewalls uh, and uh, so on. But uh, when you start uh, creating this kind of open, of open systems, uh, you don't necessarily have quite as much uh, liberty of choice uh, as uh, you used to have in the past. So <clears throat> in uh, this uh, system that they have installed in, in Lyon, uh, they actually have quite a lot of different actors and uh, networks uh, interacting. So, for instance, uh, uh, these air temperature sen sensors and irrigation valve uh, control are using uh, LoRa uh, for getting the measurements and doing the control. But they also do have a Sigfox infrastructure and servers uh, for the tree activity sensor and soil moisture sensor. And then they have uh, water tank actuators and uh, other things uh, which are using uh, some other protocols. Uh, now again, the point here is that uh, these are provided by different organizations uh, and using, of course, different protocols, uh, which happen to be appropriate there. But still, all this information is uh, published uh, and accessible uh, through OMI and ODF uh, somewhere. So again, point here you really need to be uh, sure who, who gets access to what information. And especially when you do some actuation. actuation. Okay, <clears throat> we are developing uh, quite a few other use cases uh, also, but uh, I think uh, this uh, illustrates uh, the level of challenge that we have for implementing these systems, but uh, even more uh, the challenge uh, that we get for making them safe. 
So, then to the more uh, <coughs> general topic of IoT security. Uh, uh, I wonder how much uh, time did I use, but then again, we had some. No. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> so I was very happy uh, when Bob was showing uh, more details about uh, this example uh, here. Uh, uh, one question that came into my mind uh, in both of the presentations this morning is that, uh, well, actually uh, the safest way of uh, not getting hacked is that you don't connect anything to, to the web. Uh, and uh, <coughs> actually this is uh, quite a generic uh, uh, and interesting question because uh, uh, most of the systems connected to the Internet of Things uh, currently, they were not uh, meant for being connected uh, anywhere. Uh, so uh, the old uh, car from 1976 that you showed, it didn't have any uh, of this, uh, these security uh, issues. And the Jeep uh, Cherokee uh, shouldn't have uh, or wouldn't have had initially neither, unless they, I think, unless they connected it to, to the Internet uh, and made it accessible even, even over, the, over there. <coughs> So, uh, uh, okay, there are many challenges. Uh, firewall configuration is not easy to get right. Uh, and uh, it's quite rare that you would see any cryptographical identities uh, for your things on the Internet of Things because uh, most of them were made before uh, all these uh, things uh, were interesting. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> okay, uh, how do you deal with these uh, security speci specifics of IoT? Uh, so. Uh, Actually, uh, most security basics uh, or um, security mechanisms uh, can be applied more or less as such. Uh, but then uh, the big challenge is uh, once you start going for these uh, secure connections, uh, crypto identities and so on, uh, it's uh, how do you actually uh, uh, distrib distribute these identities to your different uh, systems. Um, and uh, what we haven't uh, come up with uh, the best solution for uh, yet is actually uh, should you identify these devices uh, as uh, well using unique identifiers of all the different sensors and so on or uh, would you like to use uh, some kind of a com organization specific uh, uh, identity uh, uh, but then depending on what identity you are using it also uh, means that uh, you can only come down to a certain level of trust so the more fine-grained identity you are using for your things, the more challenging it becomes uh, to manage uh, all those identities. Uh, but uh, then you also have more flexibility. <coughs> uh, one practical thing uh, for those who have been playing around with these uh, systems is uh, how do you update these certificates before they expire? Uh, that's a nightmare because uh, then you would uh, need to do that uh, update over the air or something like this. Uh, uh, and then uh, you mentioned also these uh, software updates and that uh, some system, the, the car didn't even ver verify the, the checksum of the update. Uh, we, we would never do anything like that in control things or the open group. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so uh, you can find some uh, baseline security recommendations for IoT. There are more and more people working on, on the, this uh, topic. Uh, uh, if you go uh, and check this link, uh, I think there was a 12 or 15 pages or whatever of uh, things that, that we of course uh, con conform with. But I was uh, quite uh, surprised, uh, surprised, but in a way happy because uh, well, I didn't find anything about role-based access control to different parts of the information there. So I was unhappy about not seeing it there for one reason, but uh, at least uh, then we still have something to tackle. So. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, authorization, access control, and so on. It's uh, really about uh, uh, <coughs> when you have different uh, actors using a system uh, in different roles, uh, you would normally want to give different access rights uh, to these different users. Uh, so, uh, uh, coming well, backing off the smart city aspect, uh, I'm quite often using this uh, example of, uh, of our home. So. Uh, I, of course, uh, need to have uh, access uh, as the administrator to all systems in, in our home uh, so that I can do any update and uh, control anything and so on. But uh, uh, I, will, I would not like to share uh, the same level of, uh, of access uh, to uh, my wife and children and so on because they would uh, mess up the whole thing, presumably. And actually, uh, as you know, for most systems, uh, you don't, uh, for mo most of the uses, uh, you would like to have just a user role. Uh, even for your own home, so that you don't go and, uh, and oh, I don't know, mess up uh, with anything. Uh. So, 
this is very much the same things as, thing as we have for any, any uh, uh, computer system, uh, uh, going back to Unix and uh, even Windows and so on. Uh, okay, so <coughs> how do you uh, develop this kind of fine-grade access control, and in this case based on the standards uh, uh, by the open group? Uh, well, <coughs> to begin with uh, rapidly, what are the standard, Internet of Things standards of the open group? Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, uh, first uh, we have this open messaging interface and uh, open data format uh, that were developed by the Internet of Things uh, work group. Uh, we started off in 2010, uh, so I would say that we were among the first ones uh, tackling these kind of things based on earlier EU projects that we have, have had. And then there's the open data element uh, framework, uh, uh, which uh, was published uh, in May 2016. So, a quick look at uh, what uh, you already saw some, uh, a little bit of what uh, these uh, look like. Uh, so, <coughs> the Internet of Things with uh, OMI, ODF and ODF uh, standards. Uh, now, uh, uh, I started working with the Internet of Things in 2001. Uh, we made our first impl implementation in 2002. And uh, at that time, uh, it was uh, nobody spoke about cloud uh, and uh, uh, not to even mention fog and edge. Uh, so uh, what we uh, went off uh, doing uh, was to uh, develop systems that, that are sort of pair-to-pair -pair enabled. Now what that means in practice also for these uh, standards is that uh, we are not uh, just sending data to the cloud or something like this. Uh, you can actually have uh, machines and devices, uh, things uh, communicating di di directly with each other or uh, over different clouds and so on. Uh, as well as uh, taking the control down to, to the what is nowadays uh, called uh, the edge. So uh, <coughs> uh, there was a discussion uh, uh, yesterday with the OPA, uh, with Open Process Automation Forum on uh, on the fact that you uh, need to have different kinds of uh, software uh, depending on what device you are installing it uh, in. Well, uh, I very much agreed with what was uh, said there about that it's really about uh, how you interoperate between these uh, different uh, devices. Uh, so if that's uh, dealt with properly, then you can have different impl implementations uh, for different use cases and uh, to conform with different requirements. So <coughs> that's really uh <coughs> the philosophy that, uh, that we have uh, been using. So OMI, ODF and ODF relationships are simplified. This is uh, very much uh, simplified and I think I'm using up uh, a little bit too much uh, time. So I'll jump uh, rapidly. You'll see examples of this in just a moment. So the open da data format, it's a generic format for representing uh, sort of anything in the Internet of Things. Same structure used for publishing, discovering, querying and retrieving information. And it's also extensible and uh, uh, most of all, we, it's open for using external uh, uh, standards uh, for uh, uh, defining what is the meaning of, uh, of these uh, different uh, objects and, and info items, as we call them in ODF. So, uh, <coughs> this is what uh, an o a simple ODF uh, uh, structure would uh, look like. Yeah, it's only ODF, uh, we don't have any OMI here. Okay, so this is a, a structure that we're using, uh, for instance, uh, for air handling units in my home. That's the usual demo that I'm uh, showing. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, ODF allows you to have uh, these uh, object hierarchies, so that uh, you, which uh, has certain advantages uh, when you start sending this data. You don't have to repeat uh, the same data all over again. And uh, <coughs> this uh, type field that we have here, so what you see here uh, is an example, oh the arrows aren't going to quite the right place, oh they are there, Not, okay interesting. <coughs> so uh, in, a, in this uh, example we are using ODEF for specifying uh, uh, what kind of uh, a machine this is and uh, what kind of measurement uh, we have here. Uh, so. <coughs> This code here actually says that uh, this uh, or using uh, the sort of plugging plugging standard by the United States United Nations UNS PSC uh, version, version 18 uh, uh, that and this says that this is an air handling unit using this language agnostic code which is pretty 
useful uh, also in the vital product uh, when we have these uh, okay cars moving around in the world and going to any kinds of cities it's not always uh, that uh, that uh, you would like to have a vocabulary so that are using only english and these are already existing uh, and established uh, well used uh, standards uh, then what we also have uh, is uh, a code saying that okay this is a measurement uh, fresh air uh, that's in degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is one degree of security also that, uh, uh, as I was saying for the Helsinki use case, uh, what we were doing uh, during that week was to make sure that all the different organizations and uh, software understood uh, uh, each other in the right way. Now, if you don't have this kind of information, well, uh, everyone knows about uh, here, I, I guess, uh, some example of where uh, you got some catastrophic results uh, from uh, mixing up between degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit or, or centimeters and, and inches. Uh, so <clears throat> that's the first level. Then uh, this uh, fine-grained uh, access control. Uh, uh, for those at least who have some, uh, well, everyone has uh, some background from f file systems, uh, so you know how you specify uh, access rules. Uh, in the Unix systems and similar. Well, once you have this kind of hierarchical structure as in ODF, uh, you can, of course, apply similar rules uh, as on the Unix uh, system so that you uh, specify exactly who, which uh, users uh, will have what kind of access uh, to what pieces of information, so what objects and all the information under it, or what uh, information or even act actuators. Uh, so <clears throat> this is uh, something that we have been working on uh, quite heavily also during this year and it's uh, used in all these use cases in Biotop now. Okay, <clears throat> then to the conclusions. Uh, so uh, I think we have all uh, uh, said more or less the same thing that IoT security has implications on safety, even on the safety of citizens. Uh, so. Uh, it's uh, really something that we have to deal with uh, properly. Um, <clears throat> well, standards are essential for to the success of smart cities. Uh, uh, okay, smart cities, uh, you don't want, uh, I think it was also mentioned in some presentations uh, here earlier at this uh, conference that, uh, well, for smart cities, uh, most of them, uh, many of them tend to be a sort of one-off installations by one uh, single uh, system provider. And uh, that's not interesting for the citizens uh, and the cities because they, they rapidly end up in a, in a lock-in situation. Uh, and it wouldn't help us uh, for this uh, case of, of the BMW arriving to Helsinki, Lyon and so on. They, you, you have to have some kind of standardized, uh, standardized and open APIs. So <clears throat> then to the bold claim, uh, we are developing standards for the IoT at the Open Group as uh, I think it became clear for everyone, but uh, uh, these are also standards where security and safety are built in from the beginning, so to say. Uh, so, uh, okay, that was the point of the previous uh, slide. Uh, so these access rules and how you specify that. Of course, we are using, uh, well, uh, certificates, uh, username, passwords where appropriate, HTTPS and uh, SSL and all this uh, stuff uh, when, when needed. Okay, I think uh, that was all so from me and also with the support of Ron Schulte for the ODEF part. Okay, thank you.